welcome everybody. Uh, familiar faces from classes and students. And, uh, welcome to our latest and, and slightly off of normal time seminar session. So just a quick note, uh, we are recording and this recording will be made available at our History at UON uh, uh, YouTube page. So you can check that out and view, uh, review the highlights as, you're, as you wish. So I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, uh, wherever you may be located, but here in particular, uh, the Pamelong clan of the Wakabal people and pay respect to, to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, today, our speaker is Dr. Tom Stevenson, who is Associate Professor of Classics and Ancient History at the University of Queensland. His research interests include Roman politics and political ideology from the late Republic and early empire and the careers of Cicero and Caesar, and the first uh, centuries of emperor worship at Rome. His current research projects include a book on the history and significance of the idea of the Roman emperor as pater patriae, the father of the fatherland, and an edited collection of conference papers on the ancient Olympic Games. And uh, Tom can correct me if, uh, if that's out of date or if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, today's topic is sculpture and politics in the trans and the transformation of the Roman Republic from 100 BC to 14 AD. So with that, I'll pass it over to Tom and uh, allow you to take over. Thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, just to tell you that Olympic book came out in 2008, okay. so a little bit out of date. <laughs> <laughs> the publicly available information you yes. <laughs> I, I need to, it's probably me, I need to update uh, things. <laughs> Anyway, look, uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, thank you to Ryan in particular for all the work that he's done, all the organising and uh, all the very helpful uh, emails and so on. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, terrible to throw a party and not have anyone come. So I'm very pleased uh, that, that people have come. Thank you. And thank you for coming late on a Friday afternoon. Uh, for the people at home, I, I know I'm going to be looking up over the screen. I just, in a way, I can't help it. There's a big uh, screen above the uh, laptop screen here, but I will try to look into the uh, camera here so that uh, the experience for people at home is not uh, too off-putting. You can see my topic for today. I want to talk about sculpture and politics in the transformation of the Roman Republic from 100 BC to AD 14. And uh, in, in particular, I, I won't read all my abstract, but in particular, what I'm interested in is not a, a traditional approach to sculpture in the first century BC in particular. Uh, traditional approaches are still very much affected by the original way we used to look at Roman art in terms of style and aesthetics, with the Romans uh, apparently not having the um, aesthetic now, so the Greeks. Uh, so style uh, continues to dominate. And so they were asking the question, how can we present somebody in their most uh, aesthetically pleasing or beautiful uh, form for a particular setting, purpose, subject, uh, um, set of circumstances that would make, uh, you know, a, uh, a portrait appealing? But I don't think they're asking that sort of question, a, a sort of art, an artist's kind of question. They were asking questions like, how can we represent power of particular individuals in uh, congenial or persuasive ways, given changing uh, subjects, contexts, audiences, resources available, and so on. I'm, I'm going to try and do the latter rather than the former, because the former is still very influential in the way that uh, portraiture in particular, but Roman art in general is looked at. So I've got a different set of questions. And I just say that uh, it's also very often still the case that people think in terms of propaganda. They do this with Augustan art a very great deal. But the one thing I'd say there is that no ancient ruler, uh, even Augustus, he was very persuasive and there have been some uh, excellent books that talk about his autoritas and how persuasive could be an initiative from the emperor. But no ancient ruler had the control of somebody like Goebbels uh, with the, the Nazi regime, the total control of media, the, the complete control of content and so on. Uh, 
no ancient ruler had that. So talking about propaganda, sort of a top-down inculcation process, is a very difficult thing to do for the ancient world, and we, we shouldn't do it. It's, again, a carryover from earlier uh, kinds of scholarship, and you still see it again and, and again and again. You see the word again and again and again. I, I use it myself sometimes, so you know, if we can kind of tilt against those uh, inheritances from a, an older way of looking at uh, Roman art, I think it would help us. And I just thought I'd start, having said that, I just thought I'd start by talking about some of these uh, uh, great figures in the interpretation of Roman art uh, at the beginning of modern scholarship. So when I think about how Roman art has been uh, interpreted in the past, there are those who have advocated a traditional formal analysis. So they're interested in form and style and questions of aesthetics, how beautiful, how appealing something is in a, in a context. And then there are others, and this is in my, my lifetime, who would rather emphasise social functions of art. Now, what social relationships are supported by having a portrait of Julius Caesar in a particular context for a particular audience at a particular time with, in a particular material with particular resources behind it and, and in, a, in a form that uh, will speak to that audience. Um, I, I very much like the, uh, the emphasis on social relationships that comes with that uh, newer kind of uh, analysis, but I just say to you that the former analysis, uh, I shouldn't have said that, the previous analysis, the formal kind of analysis, talking about aesthetics, talking about uh, beauty, talking about, uh, you know, excellence in a, in a way that uh, is often uh, associated with Greek art, that's still there for... Roman art, and I think we have to kind of fight against it a little bit, try and question our prejudices, I, or question our inheritances, I beg your pardon, from what you've read, and I find it very difficult to do. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, the emphases have been on date, style, iconography, rather than social relationships, social rituals, social settings, and power. And there are more recent approaches beyond that of uh, sociologists and social historians. And uh, people are now asking about the ability of art to embody and to promote values, which I think is a nice, uh, a nice advance in scholarship. Can art promote values? Can it embody values such as austerity, uh, discipline, piety, and so on? And I actually I think it can. I think it comes out in the way people describe the effect of particular sculpture. So, uh, these are layers of interpretation or um, generations, developments in interpretation, which I think are moving us past uh, style and uh, form and aesthetics. Um, and, and I'd like it to continue. Um, and the other thing I'd say is that uh, the formal and social approaches are not as distinct as they're sometimes we made out to be. They're in many ways complementary rather than uh, distinct because uh, very often it happens that people who talk in terms of formal analysis will be thinking in terms of propaganda, so a top-down relationship, and those who think of social relationships are thinking of initiative coming from below quite often. So that, uh, you know, the two approaches, which are supposedly distinct, end up being parts of the same uh, relationship or, or able to influence one another. Okay, well, where, where do we get our scholarship from on Roman art? I thought I'd start with this guy. Um, uh, Winkelmann here, Johann Joachim Winkelmann from the 18th century. It's Winkelmann who's responsible for the formal and aesthetic analysis of style, of Roman art in particular. He had this idea that there was a classical apex of Greek art in the 5th century BC when a, a truly naturalistic style was achieved. And for him, it was an apex uh, point because he believed that naturalism was the goal of art and the Greeks achieved it in the fifth century, the wonderful uh, fifth century sculptures of the Parthenon, for instance. Now, uh, his argument was that there was no Roman style, it was all Greek. Romans were just a derivative, they just copied the Greeks, they were uh, um, not innovative themselves. And if you think that way, what it means is that you've got decline in ancient art occurring from the fifth century BC onwards. So they now, after the Bronze Age, they 
work out how to uh, depict form naturalistically, the human form naturalistically, then everything is declined for, uh, you know, from uh, the time of Pericles until whatever, late antiquity or into, uh, even into the modern day. Gosh, I, I should decline so long. It's an <laughs> extraordinary thing. It's not the only kind of, uh, uh, it's not the only kind of scholarship that does that. It thinks in terms of an organic model of rise and decline to explain historical processes. It's not at all inevitable. It's our, it's our human, it's our organic human and plant sort of uh, uh, model that is again and again influencing us. And, you know, the Greeks used it. Aristotle used it. Uh, you know, they thought of rise and decline in that uh, in that way. But if you stop and think about it, the idea that ancient art was in decline after the Parthenon. It's uh, enormously problematic. It's uh, you know, the belief that it, they were asking themselves how they could best represent a form, a human form, naturalistically. And then when they decided that, there was no other question to ask. It's, it can't be right, can it? I don't think. Some other great names, people writing on uh, Roman art in particular, uh, Franz Wyckoff, an Austrian, uh, Aloysius Regal here, another Austrian, the Vienna School is very prominent in the interpretation of uh, Roman art. And they actually, what they had to do was to get past Winkelmann and discover Roman art. And they did it through formal analysis. This kind of style is not Greek. This is, this must be Roman. And what they tend to say is the Greeks wouldn't do this. This is not, not as good. It's inferior. It's uh, ugly. It's, you know, it's uh, naff by comparison and so on. And they continue to place emphasis on stylistic change or devolution over time. So for them, late antiquity becomes a time of decline and weakness, which is technical, aesthetic, and uh, inspirational. And I thought I'd, I'd show this man, uh, Willem Ovitz. You know, he's a very famous figure in uh, classical uh, scholarship. You might not immediately associate him with scholarship on Roman art because he's a very great uh, philologist and literary scholar, but it's Vilimovitz and men trained by him and think like him, they're heavily responsible for the idea that art is inferior to literature. I can tell you, I, although this has been recorded, I should, I should watch it. I, I did work with somebody once who thought that uh, my um, Greek and Roman art course was the Pretty Pictures course. Um, so Vilimovitz uh, was extremely influential and some places, maybe it remains. He favoured philological and textual analysis over the study of ancient art. That was where the hard stuff was, you know, uh, doing your passing and uh, understanding the literary uh, predecessors of text, understanding the beauty of epic and so on and so forth. But, um, you know, you can't say, of course, that the study of ancient art is about studying pretty pictures rather than a mode of expression that's socially constructive or powerful is what I think art is. Now, uh, talking about social historians and people interested in social relationships, art as a, an expression of a social relationship, but art negotiating social relationships, well, people like Sir Moses Finley, who was the professor of ancient history at Cambridge, and then his successor, Keith Hopkins, who was in fact a professor of sociology uh, before becoming professor of ancient history at uh, Cambridge. So their approach to uh, all these questions, very different to the scholarship they inherited. Uh, social historians in applying sociological techniques, they often wrote and explicitly said that they were directly challenging the traditions of Oxbridge scholarship. The Ox Oxbridge scholarship was meant to be the focus on the literature, the, the uh, the very heavy um, philological work that, that someone like Willemovitz uh, bequeathed to them. And uh, another development that was important is the rise of archaeology from non-elite contexts since 1945. So we haven't just been interested in the rulers who inculcate from above, supposedly, also been interested in the people who are uh, below. Mary Beard has written some very good uh, work on uh, Roman art. She's a, a deconstructionist. Her great strength is to look at the status quo in a field and to say, you know what, that's not really, it's not really very well founded. Now, there's value in that kind of scholarship. If you say, look, 
this is this is the status quo that everybody believes, but this is what it's founded on. It's actually pretty weak. Now, there's value in that, but she doesn't always put something in its place. You know, so uh, valuable scholarship, but we still need to keep working to advance the field. And here's where a man like this comes in. This is Yash Elsner. It's a, a photograph from a few years ago, of, if anybody knows him. He, he works with both art and text. So he's insistent that you must have text studied alongside art, um, which you might think is something you would take for granted, but it hasn't been necessarily. Art historians do have a heavy focus on the material and uh, literary scholars obviously on, uh, on their texts. Elsner would say we're not going to advance uh, the study of Roman art in particular unless we combine the two. He places emphasis on audience reception or audience response as well as the traditional emphasis on authorial intention, the sort of uh, top-down uh, message spreading. The analysis of Ekphrasis, literary descriptions of works of art, is fraught with difficulty so that literary descriptions of art should never be accepted literally or uncritically. You might think that's a quite uncontroversial thing to say. But the way he makes it work in his analyses of uh, an ekphrasis uh, is demonstrably different to what previous scholarship had been. Um, can we imagine a cultural framework in which ancient viewing took place? The answer to that is, I think, very often no. Because... Uh, the works that we have in museums have been ripped from their context. We don't know their provenances often. We, we don't know what the setting was originally, what the audience was, what the, uh, the, the pa who the patron was, what the patron's resources were necessarily. Why did they choose bronze rather than uh, marble or in, in some other uh, medium? But to remember that we don't know those things is really very important. It sharpens your critical acumen. It makes you see that previous questions about style and form, for instance, are not getting us very far when there's so much else. We may not be able to get very far with numbers of the, the works that we look at, but you know, to have the methodological uh, nous to ask the extra questions is very important. I'm sorry. Now, there's been pushback against uh, developments in uh, scholarship on Roman art in particular, Richard Brilliant, uh, writing about new methodology. He's really talking about uh, um, social approaches, approaches emphasising social relationships. Uh, Richard Brilliant um, wants to argue that much of the social scholarship is not in fact new, and he looks at scholars like um, Rostovchev and Bianchi Bandinelli, Russian and Italian, uh, who studied art against its wider cultural framework. So they, they did use style, but they were able to understand uh, cultural frameworks from which art was emanating in a way that, that should be credited a bit more, he thinks, than, uh, than some uh, developing scholarship does. And then there's a scholarship of someone like Paul Zanka, who uh, treats the emotive power of images and their reception in a very uh, inspiring way. I've got some uh, critical things to say about one particular argument of Zanka in, the, in the, a little while, but I really do love his scholarship. It's, I recommend it to you, everybody. His uh, work on Augustan images uh, was called by Andrew Wallace Hadrill uh, in a review. He said, this is the greatest work on Augustan Rome since Symes' Roman Revolution, if you know Sir Royal Symes' Roman Revolution, which has been so... Uh, very influential. Uh, late antique art has long been analysed in terms of social change, says Brilliant. And then uh, there's semiotic analysis focused on signs and symbols. Um, Tony Holsha is a scholar who does that, and Brilliant himself does it as well. So Brilliant wants to say that we're not all stuck in uh, you know, a mindset that looks at style and form and so on. We, we have, there has been methodological development and we need to, uh, you know, we need to recognise that it's been developing for a long time and it's not just the product of uh, quite recent years. This is brilliant here. Wonderful name for a, an academic. <laughs> this is Rostov Shiv, everybody. Um, very well known. I hope you've read some Rostov Shiv. Such on economic history of the Roman world and the Hellenistic world. 
and Bianchi Bandinelli, the great Italian uh, art historian. And this is Paul Sanka, the German art historian. And this man, uh, Andrea Salfaldi, uh, a Hungarian who ended his life in the United States, or at least what I mean is he moved to the United States and uh, um, had a career at Princeton for quite a long time. Uh, his scholarship um, in the in the 30s, 40s, and 50s was already asking questions that were beyond style and form and so on. He, he was asking about uh, um, relations between uh, media, for instance, that was that were quite different. So he could put coins and sculpture and other medium media together in a way that others were not necessarily doing. Um, anyway, uh, I, I think that uh, I think that. Uh, the scholarship has been developing, they've been developing well. Uh, some of the scholarship tends to be complementary rather than contradictory. So that sometimes uh, differences that are, that are uh, trumpeted between them are not necessarily so different. But I want to keep saying to you that we're still, we're still showing the traces of our early uh, questioning in scholarship. And we want to try and move beyond that as much as we possibly can. So what sort of styles are people talking about when they talk about interpreting Roman art? Well, uh, let's, let's have a look at some of them. These are, I've just selected these. There has been a tendency to say that periods are defined by particular styles, which for me is also very problematic, that, that a period should just favour one style, or should work towards one style and then be satisfied. That again, seems to me to be problematic because we've got many different purposes, many different contexts, many different subjects, many different amounts of uh, resources you can apply, many different audiences. Uh, so I, I, you know, skeptical of the way that we have traditionally looked at things, but I could never ever undermine the degree to which people have critically analyzed uh, compositions like this and delineated the details really brilliantly, you know, beyond what I perhaps might do. If I think of classical style, I always I love this uh, metope from the Temple of Zeus at Olympia. Uh, Athena, Heracles, Atlas, and the apples of the Hesperides. Uh, Atlas has the apples in his hands, and Heracles is holding the sky on his shoulders, everybody. Uh, you can see that there's already a, a pillow in place, and yet in one version of the story, uh, he, he asked Atlas to just resume your burden for a moment because I need to get a pillow. Um, and then, of course, when Atlas resumed his burden, he was left with the sky on his shoulders again. But when I look at this, this is uh, often cited as a sort of uh, apex example of classical style. It's upright. It's focused on the figures rather than the background or landscape. In fact, there's very little background or landscape in classical art. The figures are calm, powerful, orderly, ideal in their forms and dimensions. The composition conveys effortless strength, youthfulness, beauty, balance, frequently a complex sex appeal. Viewers experience uplifting emotion. Let's see if I've got, yeah. Note the effortless display of strength as Athena holds up the sky with her upraised uh, left hand. I totally love that, that uh, image of Athena. It's extremely beautiful. Notice the uh, profile head and the frontal body. Profile heads are classical norm. Um, Heracles, in contrast, is plainly under pressure from the load. Um, he needs a pad to cushion his shoulders. Note how Athena's head and feet define the vertical dimensions of the scene. This is something you see on the Parthenon as well. Uh, note the shape of her non-weight-bearing leg as her right knee presses forward to indicate the outlines of her body beneath the woolen necklace. There's uh, classical order and balance in this pose. It's a kind of conceit of uh, classical art to have the weight-bearing leg and then the non-weight-bearing leg, which presses through the garment and tantalizes with the form of the leg um, beneath. Note, too, the shape and volume of her breasts and the youthful, unblemished beauty of her profile face. Uh, Andrew Stewart, Andy Stewart, who passed away just quite recently, has some wonderful work on uh, the sexualized glance and the controlling gaze that operates in uh, classical art. So this sort of power, beauty, um, balance, order, uh, youthfulness, lack of blemish, real power, 
uh, human figures. This is very classical. And uh, it's a meta piece, so uh, heavy sunlight means that uh, what they've done is to have higher relief at the top of the metope and lower relief at the bottom. So the sun strikes the, you know, the higher relief top and gives a, uh, you know, gives a, a, an impression that allows you to appreciate it from ground level that much more. Deep recesses, high relief at the top, lower relief towards the bottom of the sea. And the Parthenon, of course, is always talked about in terms of classical art. And here, the east frieze, the gods prepare to receive the Panathenaic procession. There's, again, ideal order, grace, emphasis on the physical form, relaxed poses and atmosphere. It's languid in places, yet it's powerful, rich with opulence and the drapery. These are the terms in which classical art is very often uh, described. And it is, in, in terms of these works that I'm showing you, uh, there is order, there is quietness, there is power, there is control, there are figures who are formidable and so on and so forth. They're not blemished figures. The Deriferos by Polycletus, the, the famous spear bearer, possibly Achilles by Polycletus of Argos, dates around 440 BC, the third quarter of the fifth century. It's seen as quintessentially classical. Um, no, notice the contraposto pose, the counterpoise pose. There's a straight right arm and the straight right leg. It's a bent left arm, the bent left leg. The hips respond, they're, they're uh, tilting with the uh, differing weight. This, this statue, again, is spoken of in terms of balance, harmony, order, ideal proportions, mathematical calculations. It's always uh, extraordinary to me to contemplate that uh, what um, Winkelmann thought of as the, the highest achievement in naturalism has actually been produced with sometimes a myriad of mathematical calculations to provide these, uh, these sorts of figures. They're, they're not so naturalistic. You know, uh, they're, they're ideal and idealized. And mathematics helps to work out these uh, body figures and types and dimensions as much as any real uh, subject. Powerful chest, relaxation, the point at which, yes, this is the so-called classical moment at which rest becomes motion. So he's just pushing off. Um, it's that point where Achilles is just about to kill Penthesilea, that high climax of a, a particular scene. This is one moving into another. Youthfulness, ideal features, sexualized glance, the nakedness and controlling gaze. And here's a bronze. Uh, this is a modern uh, rendering of that statue. I just show it to you because bronze was the preferred medium in the fifth century. And uh, we only have marble copies, many of which are, are Roman. So for us to uh, appreciate what was seen as, you know, one of the very, very great pieces of classical art, it's difficult for us to do that. We don't have the original bronze. We can't imagine the glistening surface in bright Mediterranean sunlight, like the skin of an athlete uh, covered in oil. Uh, it's an ideal youth, both coveted and feared, like Achilles, if it's not Achilles. Classical nakedness, athletic and sexual, inspiration for humans and an offering uh, to the gods. So, uh, again, a little bit more on this. Oops, I'm sorry, I, I went uh, backwards instead of forwards. All right, so classical art is held up on a pedestal. Powerful, orderly, upright, human figures, lack of blemish, all those sorts of characters. And then Hellenistic style, and again, the, the uh, very, very, uh, the very, very varied Hellenistic period is talked of very often in terms of a, a single style. It can't be right, but this is the sort of thing that they say. In terms of a comparison between the classical and the Hellenistic, this bust of Alexander the Great is not an orderly figure. He's not the upright and uh, in control and uh, lack of blemish. He's a tortured genius. Um, notice the wild swing of the head and neck. The, the leonine mane, his hair is very often shaped to resemble a lion's mane. It's warlike versus peaceful. It's very different, uh, very different to classical. Restless energy versus relaxation. Um, it's baroque, there's movement, there's uh, energy, there's exuberant detail, there's contrast, grandeur, surprise. 
uh, adornment versus simplicity, austerity, lack of adornment. Now, they're adjectives that are very often used to describe a piece like this and other pieces like it in the Hellenistic style, and it's uh, thought to be a reaction to the classical. I, I've just mentioned I don't believe it. There, there are other works in, uh, that come from the Hellenistic period which are uh, obviously more classical in, uh, in their uh, influence, in their uh, inspiration, I beg your pardon. But this is the sort of thing, this, these are the sorts of uh, sharp distinctions that are made between classical and Hellenistic work. These are Hellenistic kings, everybody. Uh, and the Hellenistic kings are never depicted as old men. Attalus I is on the left, uh, the king of Pergamon. Notice that he has luxuriant hairstyle, like uh, the uh, statues of Greek gods, for instance, and of Alexander the Great. He has an uplifted uh, part in the uh, middle of his head. Um, it's not actually parted in the way that Alexander's is, but it, uh, the very luxuriant hairstyle is a feature of uh, these kings. Ptolemy XI of Egypt, the father of Cleopatra VII, the famous Cleopatra, is on the right. Um, notice they're not bearded. Alexander was not bearded either. He was the youthful conqueror. Um, and uh, just notice that they're not aged. No Hellenistic king is ever depicted as an old man, in spite of the fact that people like uh, uh, Antigonus Monothalmus, Antigonus the One-Eyed, died in battle when he was over 80. And uh, Lysimachus uh, went into retirement only when he was over 80. So these guys did get old, but they're never depicted that way. And just to uh, show another great work of the Hellenistic period, this is the great all altar of Zeus and Pergamum, Zeus and Athena from Pergamum, from, pardon me. It's usually dated the first half of the second century BC, around 180 BC, and it's in Berlin. I haven't actually seen it. It's one of the things I would like very much to do. Go there and have a look at this uh, monument. There is a gigantomachy frieze, meaning a frieze showing gods fighting giants for control of the cosmos. Now, Atlas defeated a Gallic invasion. And so this is a, um, a symbolic representation of the forces for order, who are the Greeks, defeating the forces for disorder, who are the, um, the Gauls or the giants, as in the case of this, this particular frieze. But remember the Parthenon frieze, which was quiet and full of control and balance and order and human uh, emphasis and so on. It wasn't exuberant and uh, chaotic and mad and so on. That's what this is. The, the chaotic action actually spills from the frieze onto the steps. If you just have a look here, if I can make, make my cursor. Um, get my cursor going, everybody. Sorry, there you go. He's, these figures are spilling out onto the steps as you're walking up them. So you start off with these guys as part of a frieze, and then they're in your world. It's uh, you know, something that would not happen in uh, classical art. It's the world of myth coming into the world of reality. And, uh, you know, adjectives that are very often used to describe a phrase like this is chaos, disorder, unreality, wildness, barbarism, violence, uncontrolled movement, overblown contests, exaggerated situations, absurd compositions. Um, notice that the, this is Athena here, this, this figure, everybody. I mean, this is Athena. And she's caught at the moment where she's just about to rip the head off this giant. And she has ripped the giant away from his mother, who is uh, gay, the earth. And she's just been caught at that moment where she's about to have her victory and rip the giant's head off. But um, uh, it, it hasn't actually happened yet, but Nike has already come in to crown Athena. She's just about to uh, do this gruesome thing. This wouldn't be a classical representation. That's, that's not what the... Uh, the classical moment is about. And look at the eye sockets of, uh, look at the, uh, oh yes, uh, the drapery here also, I should say, it doesn't tease you with the form underneath. It actually is, is sort of what they call wet drapery, where it's quite clear um, and quite explicit at times. Look at the eye sockets of the giant, everybody, too. Catching, uh, catching sunlight, you get uh, all these sorts of effects that are very different to 
calm and order from a classical work. Very high relief, the shadows, the traumatized facial expression, fear, dark versus light, helplessness, etc. This is the more baroque, this is the more exuberant, this is the madder world. It's, it's described as though it's different to the, uh, the classical world. And then the Romans come along. The Romans need to have a style because there's a different period and they're Romans. It's sort of what the scholarship is about. Um, that's what, it, what we used to do. So what was the Roman style? Well, uh, scholars would normally say that a veristic portrait like this, a portrait which was called veristic because it was seen to be more accurate than the Greek forms, with all these, uh, all these blemishes, everybody, all the lines of the face, all the, the pockmarks, all the sunken uh, cheeks and so on. This is demonstrably older. There's no hair here. The, the priest has a veil over his head or perhaps he's pulled his toga up over his head. Um, this is, this is off-putting rather than uh, sexualizing in the way the glance and gaze operated in, uh, in uh, classical art. It was thought to be more truthful. And so the Romans weren't, they weren't great at uh, having aesthetic um, uh, appreciation, aesthetic skills like the Greeks. They, they weren't intellectuals like the Greeks. So they, they went, wanted something more, uh, more accurate. Uh, age versus youth, experience versus potential is no sexualized glance. It's the so-called Roman versus the so-called Greek. Now that's, that's what people used to say. And it was thought to be an ancestral preference of the Romans. They, uh, something they inherited where they used to represent their ancestors in this uh, warts and all style, as, as it was called, this very famous uh, figure here. And then this uh, Augustan statue, it seems, which has a, uh, an impressive Roman who might even be uh, a freedman uh, with, with busts, which seem to be reminiscent of the imagines that were fashioned for Roman noble houses, the imagines or portraits of their um, ancestors. Now, we have some questions to ask here because the portraits, the imagines of uh, Roman noble ancestors were made of uh, wax. So they're a very different medium and a very different impression, you would think. And features were painted on them. But uh, it seems that uh, alongside the wax masks, they could also have, uh, you know, marble portraits or bronze uh, portraits. At any rate, do you get the idea, everybody? The Roman style is supposedly the aged completely blemished rather than unblemished, um, experienced and older, and uh, warts and all, and even real rather than unreal. It's the way we used to always talk about Roman art. And by the time you get to Caesar and Pompey, well, the Romans, they, they don't have aesthetic nous, for instance, so you get discordant combinations of styles, pardon me, because Romans lack the sense of style, they lack the aesthetic sensitivity. So, uh, Caesar here is not quite young, not quite old. There's a few blemishes. He has hair, uh, which is not necessarily uh, what the sources will tell us. But look at Pompey's hair. Pompey is a middle-aged man. They're both meant to be middle-aged. He, uh, he has a, an interesting face. They're both beardless, which is uh, in conformity with uh, Hellenistic representations. But Pompey's head, it has these wrinkles here. It has a quite bulbous nose. And it's puffy and the, on, the, on the cheeks. Very reluctant to criticise him for you know, these <laughs> sorts of features. But uh, uh, given the age I am and everything, he's <laughs> self-conscious. But they look like combinations. This looks like Hellenistic hair. It's got the upturned part in the middle, the anastole, that uh, Alexander the Great used to have, uh, a feature of leonine um, sort of portraiture, everybody. Now, so scholars have looked at this, pardon me again, and they've seen combinations of uh, uh, Greek and Roman, and the Romans didn't mind the combinations because they weren't really very good at aesthetics. That's what scholars used to say. And then Augustus supposedly commits to youth and lack of blemish rather than age and wrinkles. Okay. That's the traditional way of looking at Roman art through to the age of Augustus. 
Well, how has scholarship tried to break away from the traditional focus on evolving styles and has it gone far enough? Kind of wanting to say, no, there's more room to, to go. Uh, I don't, I don't uh, imply that I know what to do necessarily, but because we, we keep going. So we need to keep evolving. We're still struggling with uh, our, um, our uh, focus on, on uh, simple style in a way that's not very helpful. This is Zanker again, everybody. He very well argued that art can express social values such as auctoritas, simplicity, austerity, loyalty, discipline, immorality, excess, lasciviousness. And Renaissance art historians would go along with that, I'm pretty sure. Um, if you look at works from the Renaissance, there, there's a work called the Pieta, for instance, you know, where the interpreters are seeing values being expressed. And that's his book, everyone, The Power of Images in the Age of Augustus, that was so heavily praised when it came out. I'm about to criticise one feature of it, but I do love it. It's much better than uh, what I was taught when I was an undergraduate. Not that I was taught badly, I wasn't at all. It's just that there have been developments. You know. So here he is. Zanker thought not in terms of propaganda, top-down or state inculcation, but in terms of ongoing discourse about power in Roman society, chains of conversations or debates to which works of art contributed. The emperor's resources gave him special influence in such conversations, but no emperor had the total control of Goebbels, as I said before. Nevertheless, the emperor's autoritas meant that his preferred view was often prominent. So he was, Zanke is thinking in terms of discourse, often initiated from above. So Augustus will build a monument or cause a particular portrait type to be adopted and copied and spread throughout the Roman world. But then it gets engaged with from below. It gets modified, it gets reciprocated, and then reacted on again. And so there's a process of continuing discourse going on rather than sort of a one-off imposition or a one-off uh, reaction. And I, I must say I like that very much. It's the way I think of political discourse. They keep going at one another and then they come back with something and they go again and again to uh, describe their power in ways congenial for the evolving situation. And that's what I think art does rather than seek the most beautiful poetry. Sanka's most famous thesis is to describe Augustan style as a reversion to the ideal youthful beauty of the classical age and as the resolution of discordant styles. Now, this is where I have a, a difference of opinion. Sanka takes this wonderful statue of Augustus on the left here, everybody, the Prima Porta Augustus, the Augustus from Prima Porta, and he points out that there are some formal similarities between this statue and the Deriferos. You can see the, uh, the right leg and the left leg, for instance. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about differences, which I think, I, I think he's gone too far in emphasising the similarities, but he's certainly right that there's some classical similarity there in the form of these two statues, one from the uh, first century BC, late first century, and one from the fifth century BC. And he says it shows that Augustus adopted classical style to resolve discordant mixes. You know, he, wanted, he wanted a style which was uh, able to express harmony and peacefulness and order and associate them with his regime. It was meant to be something that resolved mixes. There were no mixes anymore with you know, lots of hair and no hair and blemish and no blemish and so on and so forth. That's what Zanka thinks. It's surprising to me that he should argue that Augustus promoted a classical solution to the clash of styles and values evident in late Republican culture uh, because he thinks in terms of discourse. He does think in terms of conversations where they argue and answer one another back and yet he goes for this thesis that Augustus resolved, uh, resolved um, crashes. It, it seems a bit of a contradiction to me, much and all as I love the book. Uh, and there are numbers of things for us to think in the way that he makes this uh, comparison. There is a comparison to be made. The, uh, the, the legs, for instance, I showed you before, they, definitely the poses are 
are similar. But we've got to remember that the prima porta was originally uh, coloured, and the colour makes a difference. There's been some wonderful work uh, re restoring colours to some of the statues, but also to the Arapacus. If any of you have been to Rome, when the Arapacus is lit up, they actually flash lights on it in a way that uh, give you an idea what the um, ancient colours used to be. And the Doryphoros on the right would originally have been a bronze. The Prima Porta on the left would originally have been a marble statue. When you, when you think that way, you're starting to think, you know, these are different statues in conception and in a number of ways. Is he right to have compared them the way that he has? Well, Zanka says that, uh, you know, that this, um, this herm from the Naples Museum, it's a herm of the Doryphoros, coming from a cast, it shows us that there was real Augustan interest in classical style. And the casts were used to produce lots of statues of this very famous uh, example from the classical age. Now that's all true, but it doesn't necessarily support his, support his case. So Zanka says this, that Augustus opts for classical style to resolve clashes. Yet Roman art isn't easy to define or describe in terms of uniform, unitary styles that evolve period by period. There are always multiple styles, more or less appropriate for particular settings, purposes, subjects, artists, and resources. Multiple styles should be accepted, it seems to me. They indicate that there are different conceptions of power and that debates are taking place in the society over appropriate ways to represent power according to, for example, moral qualities, conventions, sensibilities, allegiances, and aims. When I look at Pompey and Caesar, I still see a mix of styles and values, Western versus Eastern, Roman versus Greek, old versus new, Roman dynasts, Hellenistic kings, Alexander. There's a, there's a mix. I think we shouldn't try and explain it away, but accept it as what you'd expect if there's discourse of the kind that Zanke himself argues for. So does the style indicate a mix of values uh, rather than a search for appealing form? I think it does. Are they dynasts rather than Hellenistic kings or Republican magistrates? Well, I think they are. Uh, do they show maturity rather than Hellenistic youthfulness or veristic agedness? I think they do. Uh, note how luxuriant and economic, note that there's both luxuriant, Pompey's hair, and economical hair rather than veristic baldness for Romans. Some lines in the face, some puffiness to the features. Are they non-definitive answers to the question, how to represent the power of new types of Roman rulers? How, how can we represent the power of a Caesar and a Pompey? Uh, extraordinary and innovative and unique as they are. They're, they're products of political discourse and debate, it seems to me, far more than the older styles of scholarship, form and, and uh, style and so on. So did Augustus return to the ideal beauty of the high classical style? Were classical models systematically adopted? Were other models systematically purged? Is a focus on values preferable to the traditional concentration on styles? I think it is, and I, I just I uh, don't agree with Sankar about uh, you know, the classical being adopted and everything else being purged. It's not right. You see, the comparison here isn't sound. Notice that there's nakedness versus military clothing. This is a cuirass. This is the paludamentum, the, uh, the great uh, purple cloak of the uh, Roman general. This hand here is outstretched and it seems to have a script in it. He's addressing troops, you would think, dressed this way. Then there's uh, the, we, perhaps we shouldn't uh, emphasize the supports too much, but this is uh, Cupid and a little dolphin. So the connection with Venus and Venus Genetrix and Julian uh, family. Uh, this is an athlete, you would think, or a uh, warrior. This is a general. Oh, sorry. Uh, or, a, or a general. He's an imperator rather than an athlete. Uh, Augustus is an orator in action rather than a figure at the classical moment sorry. Uh, between action and inaction. The prominence of the cuirass and the paludamentum are very deliberate, I think. And there are indications, perhaps, of immortality in the nakedness of, uh, of the feet. There are no military boots there, as you might expect. There are some Caesar statues with military boots uh, and a cupid and a dolphin. 
myth and history, Achilles and Augustus, there are real uh, important ways, I think, very important ways that you can distinguish these two statues rather than to say, as Zanka does, that they're classical. Keep going on this. One is marble, one is bronze. One has layered hair, one has cap-like hair. The, the bronze statue has the cap-like hair because if you have uh, cap-like hair in a bronze statue, it will still reflect the sunlight, whereas you need to play tricks with uh, layered marble to get uh, effects from sunlight. Um, dif they're different hairstyles. There's puffiness in Augustus, I think, versus smoothness and angularity. There's plasticity versus uh, a metallic kind of uh, impression. There are molded features versus angular features, and there's colour of the marble versus the bronze. I'm not so sure that you know, the comparison was, was uh, very good to begin with. The, uh, the heads of the, pr the Prima Porta and Polyclitus, are they really so similar? I'm saying they're actually not. And, and if you don't think they are, then you should question the whole idea that uh, everything by the classical was purged, because I don't think it was, even in this statue to which he resorts. Uh, is this statue of Augustus the solution to discordant styles or a contribution to political discourse? I, I think it is. Uh, just for a moment, just take the cuirass away and contemplate the effect of the Augustus statue and the pollutamentum, the, the big cloak. Imagine if he was standing there naked. Imagine if he was wearing a toga. Imagine if he had the toga pulled up over his head. Imagine if it was uh, a statue in the Senate or a statue in his wife's house as the Prima Porta is. Uh, imagine if it was in some other open setting, um, if there was a portrait in a library or whatever. The, these statues can be played with. So to make them say un, unequivocally that they're classical or whatever, it's very problematic. And the Prima Porta head to me is more 4th century than 5th century. I'll say a bit about that in a minute. The, protrude, the protruding ears are not ideal. The extended right arm can be paralleled better in 4th century work. There's an example I'll show you very soon. The relative youthfulness might have been appropriate for Octavian, but it stands halfway between Hellenistic kings and Republican magistrates. The face is puffy and plastic. The feet are more firmly planted than the Doriferos. Is a contrast drawn between a more youthful ideal of leadership and a corrupt old Republican nobility? What, what Augustus is there is not perhaps so much classical as not veristic, not not Republican, uh, or is it a continuation of discourse on appropriate social values? I, I think it is. Why is Augustus not represented like this? Well, some people have said because, as he says in uh, Raised Gestai 1.1, at the age of 19, you know, I raised an army and did all that stuff, but he wasn't 19 all the time. It's like uh, the Hellenistic kings, they were not uh, youthful all the time. Uh, do the veristic portraits indicate a class so the office-holding noble class of the late republic, rather than an individual. Everybody says, or used to say, pardon me, that these are individualised portraits of men who have had hard careers and, and all their blemishes and lines earned on behalf of the state are, are presented. But Eric Bruin has what I think is a very nice uh, discussion of these portraits and he says you know what you can recognize veristic portraits the so-called individualized portraits become part of a class when you recognize it's veristic so they define a class um, and and it's the class that augustus doesn't like the, the um, corrupt and defeated aristocratic class and is this the only way to represent that class well it's it's not i don't believe now, it's, I think it's better to think of values rather than style, but I want to, I want to just for a moment, actually I haven't, got a, I haven't got the time, everybody. I hope I'm not over time too much. Uh, am I over time? 54, okay. I haven't got that much to go. I think. Hang, hang in there, everyone. I, I want to talk about composite statues for a moment, such as this famous statue of the so-called pseudo-athlete from Delos. Is it Roman or Greek? Now, it's from the uh, Agora of the Italians, so it seems to be an Italian merchant who's powerful on the island of Delos, the great slave-trading um, island. 
And it used to be described, this statue, as a combination of uh, discordant styles, you know, the veristic head and the powerful athletic body, so the Roman and the Greek. Um, and some scholars said that this is a product of the Romans having no uh, idea of aesthetics. It's, aesthetics are ridiculous. Uh, is it ridiculous or is it an understandable mix in terms of Roman power in the Greek East? Is this uh, trying to get at prominent Romans in an Eastern context? So does it use elements that might describe a new kind of authority? Roman authority in the head, Greek authority in the body. And remember Plutarch's desire to see Roman and Greek leaders cooperate in governing the empire. So here's Delos, everybody. I just get my cursor to go. Here we go. Just there. It's from it's from Delos. So it's from the Greek world, everybody, that statue. There are examples of this verism from uh, Italy, but I, I'm one of the people who does think that the Greek examples are earlier, and it may well be that verism is actually a Greek style. There are numbers of Athenian priestly portraits which look quite veristic, and that would throw a, a lot of old assumptions in the air if it's a Greek style uh, verism. So that such portraits are statements of leadership values, and if they're produced by Greek artists, they seem to be a Greek conception of authority that was congenial to the Romans. They're not elite Roman propaganda or Greek criticism. Some scholars thought that the Romans were so stupid that the Greeks were sending them up with these sorts of statues, you know, um, putting their heads on a, uh, an athletic body because they had no sense of aesthetics and they were vain enough to do it, you know, these old uh, rich um, merchants. Uh, all because you focus on style rather than other questions. Um, age and style don't necessarily represent a distinct cultural preference and they're not indications, for example, of truthfulness or accuracy. And the thing is, you know, if the Romans were uh, lacking in these qualities and if they were as gullible as some of the scholarship has really said, then composite statues continue for a very long time. Um, this is another composite statue. Some people have thought it's of Sulla, it's in Tivoli today. But if you think of it as a, an attempt to probe uh, the new kind of authority that these dynasts represented, new ways of representing power, then uh, you know, if you look at this statue, you, you could think back to Augustus and you can think to yourself that this could have been rendered as a statue with a cuirass. A, uh, a general's breastplate. In fact, here's the cuirass here, everybody, on the, uh, on the support. These composites are not just composites in the old head and the young body. They're composites in these detachable elements, the cloaks and the cuirass, and you can have military boots and so on and so forth. Uh, what if they are then? You know, I think it's better to look at them as uh, essays on evolving discourse about uh, new styles of authority in a, in a very difficult period. So if you remove the cuirass, which the Tivoli general uh, does, if you think that this is an imperator plus an orator, the, uh, the statue is holding out its arm to uh, address a crowd. Now, it's absolutely true that the fingers and the hand in particular have been restored, but there was an extension of the arm, which you would think is uh, representing a, an orator. Uh, it's mortal and divine. It's a man fit to rule a Hellenized empire, a ruler fit to be deified, a man whose power should be subject to constant discourse. These are all the ideas that are surrounding uh, justifications of power in this world. And I can see, uh, you know, uh, elements that seem to be part of an essay on that uh, question. And here, here's some Roman orators, for instance. That, that uh, Augustus statue is not just... Uh, the athlete that Achilles is, or the warrior that Achilles is, in the uh, fifth century example. And here's a fourth century example of the outstretched hand, everybody. It's, uh, you know, uh, and, and this is something that compares with the Prima Porta Augustus, and it's not fifth century BC, it's fourth century BC. So Zanka's comparison is looking more and more unsteady the closer you look at it. And you can go into the imperial period and find more composite statues. 
This is Claudius, of course. Uh, you know, the Romans seem to have accepted discourse. Um, there isn't any resolution of uh, values. They're competing values. They can be talked about. They can be discussed. They can be applied. There's no implication of resolution of political discord, I think, if you have these uh, combination statues. Oops, pardon me. This is Claudius. Note the eagle of Zeus, the eagle of Jupiter, pardon me, the wreath of a triumphator, the mature head, the powerful torso, the scroll or text of the speech in the left hand, the toga, not, not completely worn, the patera, the plate. Uh, he's both mortal and immortal. He's a general and an orator. He's a Hellenized Roman. He's a ruler with appropriate uh, qualities. It, uh, I like it as an, an essay discussing the merits of various uh, conceptions of power that the emperor has. It's not, Rome isn't Russia. Uh, styles competed and coexisted rather than superseded one another, and they've long done so at Rome. They were used according to, for example, resources, purpose, context, conceptions of power. And I can go on just a little bit more if I can. It's not just that the statues themselves have elements that are mixes, but there are statues that would have looked very different from one another that can be uh, used in particular contexts. So mixing is uh, a, a very regular thing if I read uh, Roman art properly. Some people have thought that this statue here uh, could represent a Roman general from the second half of the second century BC. And so people have asked, you know, is this Scipio Aemilianus only because he was a prominent general of that, that period? Why would it be wrong to represent a Roman general in this way in a, uh, in a garden at his home, for instance, or in the, uh, the house of a freedman who was a client of the, uh, the uh, general or the patron? You wouldn't have this statue in the Senate. You wouldn't have it on the rostra. But that's exactly what I'm saying about conceptions of power for context, for purposes, for resources, for uh, individuals, and so on and so forth. Um, it, a Hellenistic impression. It's uh, got features uh, in common with the um, great altar. This might be thought to be a bit more classical, but uh, look at look at the elements here. Look at the very voluminous toga, which you would think, um, you know, is uh, something related to Roman tradition. And sometimes this is called uh, Augustus's Pontifex Maximus, but we should be very careful about that because Augustus and Roman leaders were sacrificing and pouring libations all the time for various purposes. So it's not necessarily when he became uh, Pontifex Maximus in 12 BC. And the Arapacus has been linked with the Parthenon frieze, upright figures, stateliness, balance, order, uh, power, pose, you know, that's that's fine with me too. The Meroe head has been uh, linked with classical examples. The the turn to the left, uh, uh, the turn to the right. I beg your pardon. Now the Meroe head uh, was found in Sudan. It's a, a piece from Africa that's now in the uh, British Museum. And you know I don't mind some comparison with the urn of the Doryphoros. But again, the uh, the um, bronze and the uh, the glass eyes that have been that have survived with this head, uh, and the the hairstyles different, and so on and so forth. I think we should look at ambiguity. We should look at mixes. We should look at differences. We should look at the fact that color was used, uh, and and this, you know, in in color uh, gives a very different impression to what you see in the Vatican. You know, the bleached uh, the bleached, and and verism didn't die. You know, that it wasn't purged, it wasn't kicked out, um, because freedmen and freedwomen used it. And it seems they used it because it had some cachet still for what, uh, was, what it was thought to uh, function as in the earlier period. Okay, finally, my conclusions, everyone. <laughs> um, so artistic style as a series or sequence in search of ideal beauty has been misinterpreted, I think. Roman art reflects discourse rather than propaganda. Political discord was not eliminated in the Augustan age. Discordant elements, so-called discordant elements, changes, differences, mixes, etc., they remained. Civil friction, cultural ambiguity continued from the Republic to the Empire. We know that. So why don't we think that art would reflect that? Um, art reflected these ongoing political civil difficulties, making contributions to 
representations of congenial power from different perspectives in different circumstances. Augustus didn't eliminate the problems and the artistic style or really styles of his reign did not go so far as to claim that he did. Uh, I'll leave it there, everyone. Thank you, Tom. Thanks for that very fascinating overview. And hopefully, uh, yeah, we all came away with a deeper understanding of our history and the controversies around it. We do have a time uh, for a few, a couple questions, perhaps. And I have trouble monitoring the Zoom. I don't know if there's people that are off screen, so I don't know if there's. Okay. Um, I might leap in and ask a question, if I may. Um, you say you you. Uh, so you talk about this being a, um, uh, a discourse going from the top of society down and back and forwards. Uh, and I was really interested by the fact that one of the last images you showed was a statuary by freed uh, uh, form, form, former slaves. So how far down the social hierarchy do you see this discourse as extending? Uh, I don't think there's a demonstrable difference between, a, for instance, senatorial ideology and a um, plebeian ideology or something like that, uh, because I do think it operates through discourse like this. And I, I think uh, scholars kind of recognise that. Uh, that idea might work in other cultures where you have an elite uh, culture and a uh, more plebeian culture, but at least in relation to Rome and Italy, uh, they, they're sharing ideas. They all know about the emperor as uh, father of the country. They all know about the emperor as uh, a divus. They uh, will debate the, uh, they all know about autoritas and dignitas and uh, um, meeting at the homes of patrons and uh, you know having a salutatio in the morning and so on. They share a very great deal. They'll debate about what they'd like to see in a particular set of circumstances. They might want, at a time of famine, they might want a more beneficent emperor, uh, to give handouts and so on. So they'll, they'll factor that into their discussions. You know, a good ruler is meant to be one who is beneficent to his people, uh, operates as a father, as a patron. That sort of thing I think is happening. So it goes all the way down. And, and that, uh, that sculpture to which you were referring shows that people of means, even if they were born slaves, were aware of it too. And uh, for their social promotion purposes, they could use it. I've got a half-formed question. <clears throat> it's not really a question. It's about um, the Romans taking statuary from the rest of the world, bringing it into Rome. It must have had some sort of impact on styles and all of that. So when they, you know... I know you can't measure any of, any of that, but that must be part of the discourse too, that change of bringing in all this stuff and everybody sees this new array put in a temple or whatever it is. It must have had some sort of impact as well. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, you'll know that there are some people who push back against the uh, influx of all this uh, wealth, all these cultural artefacts coming from the East in particular into Rome, and they talked a bit. And it wasn't just material, it was ideas. So uh, Cato and people will talk about uh, Eastern material coming in in um, triumphs, you know, particularly exuberant triumphs uh, in the 170s uh, in particular. Um, and, and, you know, they'll say this is, a, this is going to corrupt the, uh, the purity and the innocence of Roman culture. But they say that also about Greek ideas and about Greek peoples like philosophers and teachers and so on. And uh, what I see that being is discourse because the Romans don't get rid of those things. They find ways to use a Greek cook. They find ways to use Greek uh, doctors, even though Cato says you should never go to Greek doctors. They, they uh, make a habit of killing you, you know. <laughs> don't go to a Greek doctor. Um, so they, there's pushback, but they use them. So they all get put into the, into the mix. And some people can find them congenial uh, and they will use them and they keep using them. Pompeii shows us, Herculaneum shows us that there are 
uh, Hellenized images that seem to have been in the expansive gardens of these uh, well-to-do people. So there are settings where you can really, uh, you know, where you can have naked statues and quite, you know, lascivious statues. Mm -hmm. I often wonder about, uh, you know, some of the children's statues the, uh, that you get from Pompeii, the sleeping satyrs who are young boys and so on. And they were, Andy Stewart has written a bit about this. And he, he, I know there's one article he talked about where mm -hmm. um, the positioning of one piece, if he, if he understands it correctly, you would come upon it quite suddenly and you'd see that uh, it's a, a naked youth and you might have one reaction, but then it's it's the satyr. So you, you look at it first of all and you see that it's a naked youth and the male is the viewer. So come around, you think it's a naked youth, you have one reaction, then you get closer and you see that it's got ears and it's probably not sleeping, it's sort of um, stupefied by drink for a short time. And when it wakes up, it's going to be really um, sexually aggressive and dangerous and you're the one in the vicinity. So it's, you know, that they, that's a transgressive uh, kind of statue if it's interpreted that way. But there are settings in which it can be used. Mm. So mix, Jane, rather than resolution is what I keep coming to. Yeah, I'm convinced by your argument. I think you're right. <laughs> so Cicero talking about um, Asiatic and Attic styles of oratory. And also picking statue or statuettes for his own sort of gardens and stuff and, and picking and choosing and seeing what's right for one location and, you know, in a grotto somewhere, what will I put there? Yeah. Good for you. Yeah, I hadn't actually <laughs> thought of that, but uh, that's a very good um, a very good piece of evidence for showing that he wasn't, uh, he was looking for things appropriate to settings, as you were mm -hmm. saying, rather than the most beautiful uh, Know, get me a uh, get me a satyr or get me a, an athlete or get me a, a, a goddess or whatever. Um, yeah. Being mindful of time, we might just go with Tanika. You had a question? And, uh... oh, mine has been answered in the process of that um, ongoing conversation. I just, um, the idea that one contextual interpretation cannot account for all unknown contexts um, really hit home for me. I, I love the fact that so much of this comes down to almost anti-binary thinking. Um, it can be all things. It doesn't just have to be. A clash is such a beautiful interpretation of and rallying against such a long history of scholarship in particular. Like, do you think that that whole domestic push, um, that want for knowledge for more dom domestic contexts and how that changed our approach in scholarship in particular is part of I guess, a more working class perspective being introduced into scholarship itself, like it's almost a mirror image moment. Some people have uh, said this, that there's been a, a change in the social uh, backgrounds of scholars. Uh, they're not, uh, you know, British males from rugby and Harrow and Eton and Christ Hospitalers and all these wonderful, wonderful schools. Uh, there's a much broader uh, social uh, set of social settings from which people derive. Um, I went to an, a good school. It was an all-boys Catholic school in Sydney. It was just a regional school. It's a school you went to if you're from that region. It wasn't selective. And, uh, you know, my colleagues pretty much are similar. Um, and perhaps they're more sympathetic. People have said this to uh, a different perspective and to different interpretations, you know, not being so sim sympathetic to... Uh, um, rulers who behave kind of aggressively to their, their people. Uh, and it goes with archaeology as well. There's been a definite interest in uh, uh, non-elite contexts in the lives of ordinary people. You know, uh, um, not just putting, uh, not just putting kind of nondescript pottery to one side if it's not decorated, for instance, but asking, hang on, who used that? Uh, was it used in the same house as a painted pot? Uh, or is it different people using it at different times of the day or for different purposes or whatever? So my, my answer is a yes to what you <laughs> do think so, yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Tom one more time for his paper. <laughs> so our next seminar is on Friday the 12th. We resume our normal 10 a.m. Uh, time slot. 
And our presenter will be our very own and my new colleague Tanika Kuzman talking about her trip to Athens or to, to Greece, Athens, Olympia, and Delphi, visiting sites of significance in Greece 2022. So hope to see you there and uh, just have a great weekend.